Dear Lord, thank you again for giving us this opportunity that we can uh, look at your word and learn more about your love. Please be with me as I speak, and please uh, speak your message through me. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I'm not a preacher, but they asked me to speak today. And um, it's kind of interesting. Before, I was already studying this on this topic that I'm going to speak on before M Michelle told me the topic, so that was kind of cool. <laughs> and this is something, this study is for me, and I hope that you guys are blessed from it as well. So, let's see if this works. Our scripture reading was 1 John 4, 7, and 8, that Jira read for us. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God. And knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. I feel like we hear God is love a lot, at least me, growing up a Christian, and pretty much people just say God is love and we kind of take it for granted. But when we think about it, that God doesn't just have love, He is love. And this word right here in this verse, this word for love, it's translated, um, it's, it's agape love, which means a love that's unselfish, that doesn't want anything in return. So, huh, that didn't come out right. This heart was supposed to be around the is. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> God is love. He doesn't just have love for us, but he does have love for us. But anybody in the world that has love for anybody else or anything, the reason they have that love in their heart is from God. Even if they're, they don't acknowledge God or claim to follow God, the capability to love is from God. Let's go back. Uh, we're going to go back to the beginning in Genesis. Genesis 1, 26. I like to read out of my Bible, even though I have it on the screen. Back to creation. When God made man, he said, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And 27. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So we're made, what does it say? In, let us make man in our image. So God wanted to make us like him. And I was curious what that word Im image is translated to. And it's basically, it says, from an unused root to shade, a phantom, illusion, or resemblance. And to me, I think resemblance, this is in the Strong's Concordance, I think resemblance is probably the word that they meant in this translation. So we resemble God, Jesus. We're physically like Jesus. Jesus has arms and legs, and I think we're shaped like Jesus. But also, he put his character in us, his love in us. God made us to be like him. I don't know, to me, I think that's pretty amazing. Um, animals, also, we may not have been, they were not made in God's image, but he still designed them, specifically, each one, unique. And I believe that God also put some of that love in the animals, too. So after God created everything, it was all perfect. The animals were perfect and loving. The, we were, the people were full of love for each other, Adam and Eve, and everything was going good. And it'd be nice if it would just end, like right there. <laughs> I could just sit down. Like everything was good. But unfortunately, we know the story. It did not end like that. 
sin came into the world. And sin and Satan brought sin into this world and made our perfect world unrecognizable. Now there is pain and death and sadness and just so much suffering all around. We read in the Bible in just a few chapters after creation, so that was in Genesis 1, just over in chapter 6 and verse 5. This shows us the condition of the world. We don't know exactly how many years this was, but it doesn't seem like it was that long. That long. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It's hard to imagine that, but I don't know. These days it's not really so hard to imagine anymore. You can see it. Kind of, <laughs> I think we're getting there again. But sometimes with all the pain and, and suffering and death we see around us, it's easy, easy to forget that God is still love. But we know that God is still love, and he's still on his throne. He's still in control. And we can still see evidence of his love if we look in the world. Um, one of the ways that God shows his character of love to us is through nature. And I don't know about you, but I love animals and wildlife and learning about them. And this is actually something that I was st studying uh, before I was asked to do this sermon. So it worked out good. But it, the theme, I didn't know the theme of love, so praise God. So today I want to look at a few examples of am animals exhibiting this unselfish love. The first one I want to look at are vampire bats. How many like vampire bats? They're cute. <laughs> I think like I feel like they have a bad a bad rap because I mean they do eat blood, so it's kind of a turn off to some people. But bats have some uh, amazing traits that we can learn from. They have done studies on colonies of vampire bats. Um, they, I guess they took little microchips, little tracking devices, and they strapped it to a back, the backs of a whole bunch of bats. They did a, multiple studies and controlled uh, tests or studies, and they found that the bats, they'll go out at night to feed. They'll, they feed on cows or whatever they can bite and get some blood. And then they go back to their roost in their cave or wherever they live, and some of the bats don't get to eat. Like maybe they couldn't find food somehow. And they found that the bats who ate that night would share their food, they regurgitate their, their meal, and they share it with their friends who didn't eat. And they can tell, I don't know how, but they can somehow tell the, the bats that haven't eaten. And actually, I read, uh, it only takes, if a bat doesn't eat for three days, they'll die. Kind of, well, not like us, but <laughs> I feel like that. So it's actually very important that they eat. And you know, some say, well, they're, they're just doing that to support their colony, which is true. It does uh, benefit them by benefiting the whole colony. But at the same time, that is an unselfish thing that God put in the bats, that they would be able to share their food with a friend who didn't get a bite that, that day. <laughs> no, pun intended. <laughs> All right. Next one is dolphins. You've probably heard stories about dolphins. Dolphins have been known to help people who are in danger in the water. There's a lot of stories about them rescuing people in different situations. I think it's pretty interesting. They don't get anything out of helping these people. Like if someone is in danger, there's no benefit to the dolphin to save a human. But they do it. It's like they just enjoy helping. So it's pretty cool. I have a few stories I want to share. In 2002, look at that smile. They just look happy. 
In 2002, a 36-year-old Australian man named Grant Dixon was fishing in northern Queensland along with a few other people. Hours later, the vessel collapsed in the water and Dixon found himself alone in the middle of the ocean, holding only to the, remaining, the remainings of the boat. He had some wounds bleeding profusely and with horror, he discovered a group of sharks swimming around him. However, he watched with amazement how a pod of dolphins began to circle him, scaring away the sharks that might have attacked them by confusing his legs with some prey because of the blood. In the end, Grant Dixon was rescued safe and sound. So, can you imagine that? So the dolphins protected him. They had nothing, nothing to gain by saving that man. In 2004, a group of lifeguards and a young woman from New Zealand were training at sea when a white shark, about three meters in length, suddenly appeared in front of them. But fortunately, soon a small pod of dolphins arrived surrounding the group and the woman. They waved their tails and created lots of noise to dissuade the sharks from attack, from attacking them until it decided to go away. It's cool. Uh, let's see. We got one more story here. Uh, Todd Endress, a 24-year-old surfer who was practicing his favorite sport on August 28, 2007. He could not imagine that moments later a great white shark was going to wallop him and then give him two severe bites. The terrified young man saw his death close when suddenly about 15 bottlenose dolphins appeared and surrounded him to form a barrier between him and the shark. This protection allowed Todd to get safely to shore although with severe wounds from which he later recovered. Kind of reminds me of Jesus. You know, the devil just wants to attack and kill us. But Jesus got in the middle and saved us. And I know he gave that to the dolphins for us to see. All right, baboons are another one. These are one of my favorite animals. I say that about every animal, though. <laughs> There's a man, a man who studied baboons almost his whole life. His name is Eugene Morais. He studied them in South Africa. He was a sad man. He was depressed all of his life, and he actually ended in his life in a sad way of suicide. But he wrote a book called My Friends the Baboons, and it's... Uh, kind of like his journal of studying that, these baboons for many years. And this is a story he writes in his book. On one occasion, I witnessed in the broad daylight the hatred and accompanying bravery of the baboon, baboon for the leopard. Mr. Dolph Snyder was cutting poles in one of the kloofs, a kloof, I had to look this up, in South African, it's a uh, ravine, a narrow ravine one of the kloofs and of the Hanklip Mountains where I was spending a few days with him. At the time, we were at the top of a narrow kloof, I'm just gonna say ravine, a narrow ravine which ended in a basin of kranzes. A kranz is a sheer rock cliff, <laughs> a face. Um, for some time, we could not, let's see, on, on the highest cliff, we saw a troop of baboons, obviously in a state of extreme excitement. For some time, we could not discover the cause, although from the kind of noise they were making, I guessed at the presence of a leopard. And finally, we saw a large male leopard creeping on a ledge against the face of the, of the cliff. Directly above him were the baboons, but so far above him that they were, there was no chance of an attack. We could see the animal was making its way to the entrance of the cave in the ravine at the edge of, edge of the ledge. But long before it reached its haven, its haven of refuge, the distance between the two crayons narrowed so much that the leopard had to pass no more than 12 feet below the baboons. And here, two large males awaited it. As I well remember, what then happened was greeted with the exclamation of surprise and encouragement from both of us. Just as the leopard passed immediately below the two baboons, they cast themselves without hesitation 
to the depth below, and both landed on the tyrant. There was a moment of confused struggling. Then we saw the leopard, as is its habit, lying on its back with one baboon between its forepaws, while the other gripped it from behind and prevented it from also using its hind claws. The first baboon, however, had the leopard by the throat, so that from the start the leopard could not use its teeth. The struggle was short. The great eye teeth of the baboon soon did their work, and within a few moments, the huge leopard was motionless under the baboons. But the first hero had sacrificed his life in the attack. On both flanks, the claws of the leopard had exposed his lungs, and the baboon died just a few moments later. I think we took no little share in the rejoicing with which the troop greeted the fall of their arch enemy. I thought that story was pretty touching to see the love they had. Who do you think put that in the baboon? It had to be God. Just as, you know, it reminds me in the Bible where it talks about the devil as a roaring lion, you know, similar to a leopard seeking whom he may devour. He's after us, but Jesus wants to save us, and he, he gave the ultimate price, paid the ultimate price to save us. So we can learn a lot from the baboons. This is another animal. Who, ha who here has a dog? So... I don't really have to tell you, if you own a dog, you know that God definitely put something special in the dogs. <laughs> I think he gave us dogs just to show us his unconditional love for us. Dogs can be mistreated. We shouldn't mistreat them, but they are, and they still love their masters. It's amazing. They're very forgiving. They all love Melissa in this picture. You can see. <laughs> That's Zegan on her lap right there. Have we ever mistreated Jesus? I have. We all have. We've all sinned. He was treated horribly. And he still loves us. Let's turn to uh, turn our Bibles to John fifteen thirteen. It says, "Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life." For his friends. Would you give your life for a friend? I think I might. How about an enemy? <laughs> if I'm being honest, I struggle to just be nice to people that are rude to me, much less give my life for them. <laughs> but Jesus, he died not only for people that didn't like him, but for people that hated him. Romans 5.8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were the enemies of Christ, people that hated him, the people that killed him. He died for them, and he died for you and me too. As we... Get closer to the end of the world. I think that Jesus is coming soon. You can see so much, uh, like we were talking about earlier, so much wickedness happening in the earth. In Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the end of the earth as we get closer to Jesus coming. He said, as be And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Do we see this happening today? In the world? I think we can if we just hear the news or 
Just look, look around. And that word, that same word love right there is the self-sacrificing love. People are selfish. They don't want to help people. They just want to do their thing. They don't want to help anyone else. But the, long, the closer we get to Jesus coming to the end of the world, the less and less love we're going to see out there. So as Christians, it's our duty to, we need to keep having this love and not let the world rub, rub off on us. Not let our love grow cold. Jesus said, in this next one, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. John 13, 35. Have you ever met someone, and before you even know anything about them, you can just tell, I think that person's a Christian. There's a few times when I've met people like that. Actually, just recently, I met with a man for work, a client, and I was out there at his house talking to him, and I was just thinking in my head, I was thinking, this guy, he's, I think he's a Christian. And just by the way he acted and his mannerisms and the way he spoke, and he didn't say anything about Jesus or preach to me at all, and I didn't tell him I was a Christian, but I thought, I think this guy is a Christian. And sure enough, as I was leaving, he comes out with a Christian book, a great controversy, and gives it to me. And I was like, I knew it. <laughs> but I want, I want to be like that. I want people to be able to tell that I'm a Christian. Um, let's see. Last verse we want to, I want to look up is 1 John. This one is not in my slides. I added it. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. No, sorry, 318. It says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So we're talking about love today and trying to, wanting to show love to others and be more loving, but we need to do more than just talk about it. It says in deed and in truth. That means basically love in action. We have to show that we have love by what we do, not by what we talk about on Sabbath while we're in church. So my goal is to be more loving and especially to people that don't love me. And it's impossible without Jesus. It's not something that I can do because we have sin. We're sinners. But with Jesus, we can have that love and show that love to the world, loving the lost and those who need a Savior. So we'll have an opportunity this afternoon to show Jesus' love in, in deed and in truth during the outreach when we go to the park. So I hope that everybody can come over there and join us. All right. Well, if this is your, if your goal is also to be a more loving and lovable Christian, please stand as we have our closing prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for what you've shown us in your nature and also in the Bible about your love for us. Thank you for dying on the cross for us, even when we were your enemies. And we just want to be more like you. Please put your love in our hearts and help us this week and always to remember what you did for us and that we would show that same love to others. And not to just talk about it, that we would actually live it. And we thank you for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Declaring to each individual their eternal value in Jesus and preparing them for his soon return. This has been Anderson SDA Church in Northern California. Thank you for joining us. For more information, visit our website at andersonadventist.org. We look forward to seeing you next time.